All right, I've been given 15 minutes to convince you guys that missions is changing. Now, when I say that missions is changing, I'm not talking about some small changes here. What I'm saying is that there are changes that are happening right now in missions that are so significant that I think it's gonna affect the way that we fulfill the Great Commission for generations to come. That's a pretty tall order though. So let me try to walk you through why I think that that is the case. So if we go back just over 200 years ago, I know that's a long ways, but if we go back to the beginning of what is known as the modern missions movement, uh, there was a guy by the name of William Carey, and William Carey, uh, he basically stood up and he said, you know what, this passage in Matthew 28 that talks about us going and making disciples of all nations, I, I think this passage, I think it still applies to us today. Now, I know that sounds crazy to you guys because we pretty much assume that nowadays, right? That the Great Commission is for all churches and all times and all places. And it is our job to go to the nations. But back then, it was really common for people to think that that only applied to the apostles. And so that when the apostles died, that was kind of done and it was over with. And so William Carey says, no, 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 that's not the case. In fact, this is as much a task for us today as it was for the apostles. And for that matter, it is a task for every church from here on until Jesus comes back for his church. And so when he kind of blew the trumpet, so to speak, for the Great Commission, what wound up happening is the modern missions movement started to unfold. And as that occurred, we started realizing that we had an obligation to go to the nations. And all of the response to that really centered around answering one basic question. If it is our responsibility to go to the nations, it is our responsibility to share the gospel, what are we gonna do about it? You know, earliest attempts were made by men like William Carey and Adoniram Judson, and when they went, man, it was tough. It was hard stuff. These guys, they'd pack up all their belongings, they'd pack up their families, and they would get, I kid you not, on a boat, and they would travel on a boat for two months to go overseas. It was dangerous travel, it was dirty travel. Sometimes they didn't make it. In fact, everybody that was going knew it was a one-way trip. So some of the missionaries would even pack their belongings in a coffin because they knew they weren't coming back. It was costly and it was a great sacrifice. And for the longest time, that's what it meant to go be a missionary, right? And then about 60 years ago, though, there was another big shift that occurred. The airplane became a thing. And when the airplane became a thing, the, the nations were no longer two months away. They were two days away. And so all of a sudden, it became cheaper and easier for us to get missionaries overseas. And so we were able to send many, many, many more. The numbers that we were able to send after the airplane became a piece of technology we could use went up uh, exponentially. And in addition to that, there was another shift that changed the way that we were doing missions. You see, churches started to realize, well, not only can we send a long-term missionary now, we can take five or six or 10 people and we can load them up and put them on a plane. And for a week or two weeks, we can go over and we can serve alongside that missionary that we sent. And so we can go over there and we can serve and we can encourage and we can help out with that task. And so the short-term missions movement began. Now, how many of you guys have been on a short-term trip? Just show of hands here. Look around the room right quick. Do you see how many, the vast majority of people in this room have been on a short-term trip? In fact, that's how I was introduced to international missions. And I imagine for many of you guys, that's what happened for you too. And really, for the last 60 or so years, that's been our paradigm. We send people long-term to be missionaries on the field, and then churches will send over short-term teams to support and serve in that work and to encourage the missionaries as they're going. And that really kind of catches us up to today. And I want you to know that there are some changes today that I think are going to add significant facets to the ways in which we fulfill the Great Commission. They're gonna revolutionize it. You see, today is really kind of a weird time for missions. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. So on one hand, it is easier than it has ever been for us to go to the nations. Travel is cheaper, quicker, safer, faster than it's ever been. And when you add to that the internet, communication has gone global. Really, we're at a position where you can talk to just about anybody in the world from anywhere in the world instantaneously for free. 
These things are making it easier. The world's more connected than it's ever been for us to go to the nations. But in another sense, it is actually getting harder and harder and harder to be a missionary in large portions of the world. You see, there are in many countries overseas right now, social, religious, and even governmental persecution that actively opposes the spread of the gospel. And that opposition is not getting smaller, it's getting larger. There are whole countries where governments have made it illegal to share the gospel, accept the gospel, or to plant and start churches. So if you want to be a missionary and you want to go to one of these countries, if they know that's why you're coming, you're not getting in. Because they're doing everything they can to keep their citizens from ever having an opportunity to hear the message that you want to bring. And if you're there and they find out that that's what you're doing, they'll kick you out. Or they'll put you in jail. And for those countries, if there are any actual believers in the country, if there are churches there, those believers are an even bigger threat. For them to share their faith could mean jail time, it could mean death. And so right now, in large portions of the world, there are whole areas that have little to no access to the gospel. Here we are, 2,000 years of sharing the gospel later, and there are whole areas of the world that have no access. I don't mean they don't get to hear it as much as we do. I mean they will have never heard it, and unless something changes, they will never even get a chance to hear it. Now, for those of us who have tasted of the goodness of the gospel... That should be an absolutely intolerable thought. That there are whole people groups who will live and die and never have an opportunity to even hear the name of Jesus. And so right now, perhaps more than ever, we have an obligation and a responsibility to go. See, that's not the way that missions is changing. If anything, we need to send more long-term workers than we have sent in the past. We need to come up with as many avenues and pathways as possible for us to be able to get as many of us as we can over to the nations where there is no access to the gospel. David was talking earlier today about all of the creative pathways and possibilities of using your talents and, and your resources and perhaps your job training to be able to put yourself in a position where you can provide access in a place where there is none. And that needs to happen. But what I'm up here to talk to you about is the fact that every one of us in this room, right here and right now, for every one of us, God is currently arranging another way for the least reached, at least some of the least reached peoples in the world to have access to the gospel. And that way is you, right here and right now. You see, yes, it is easier for us right now to go to the nations than it has ever been. But that is also making it easier for the nations to come to us. In Acts 17, Paul is preaching the gospel to a whole bunch of lost people. It's this thing that he does periodically in the, in the New Testament. And as he is doing it, he is, he is sharing the gospel with these people and he starts talking about the God of this gospel and he provides this beautiful statement about who God is and how God works. He says this, he says in Acts 17, 26, he says, from one man, he that he is God, has made every nation of men to live all over the earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him. You see, God is not just the creator of the nations. He is also their director. 
and throughout history, it is God's sovereign will and his purposes that have orchestrated the movements of mankind across the face of the earth. And the Bible tells us he does that for a reason. It is so that they might seek him. God wants all peoples to know his great name. And throughout history, right now included, God is working to orchestrate that end. You see, right now, the last 20 to 30 years, global migration is occurring in a way that it has never occurred before, at least as, any, as far as any of us can tell. There are more people moving from one country to another country right now than we have ever seen. At last count, 232 million people were global migrants, or they were living in one country that was not their country. 232 million. And God is orchestrating these movements. But hear this, out of all of the countries in the world, there's one country that stands above the rest in number of migrants it has received. In fact, it stands far and away above the rest. Of that 232 million, 42 million live in one country. And I'll give you guys one guess as to which country that is. You see, in God's wisdom, at least for right now, he is moving so many of the peoples of the world to the United States. And let me tell you, of that 42 million people, millions of them, millions of them are from those same least reached places with little to no gospel access that we were just talking about. I hope you guys are starting to connect the dots. Because if you'll realize as God is moving people around so that they can seek him, and there are all of these areas in the world where people have no access to the gospel, it is no accident that God is plucking up people from areas of the world where they'll never have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And he is resettling them in the heartland of evangelical Christianity. God is at work in the movement of peoples right now. He's doing something. And I want you to imagine how this can change missions. We still need to send people. We need more to go. It doesn't change that aspect, but what it does is it opens up a whole new avenue for us as the church to be able to have access, unprecedented access, to the least reached peoples of the world. On our home turf, where at least currently, we don't have to worry about getting kicked out for religious reasons, right? We don't have to worry about being able to openly share the gospel with these people. So God is at work. Imagine the possibilities here. Nashville, Tennessee, known for country music and big belt buckles, right? Nashville is now home to the largest collection of Kurdish peoples in the world outside of the Middle East. Washington, D.C., there are more Ethiopians there than there are anywhere on the planet except for their own capital city. And right here in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the Triangle area, the South Asian Association, it has over 100 thousand names on its roll. <laughs> you believe that? Over a hundred thousand South Asian Indians. If you go 45 minutes down the road, there is a six million dollar Hindu temple that will rival anything you'll see in India. Imagine the possibilities for the Great Commission if we open our eyes and realize what God is doing with the movements of peoples right now. People are moving for all kinds of reasons. A big reason is international students. Most of you probably know an international, excuse me, an international student where, where you go to school. Many of those international students right now that are coming to the US, they're from Saudi Arabia. So imagine with me a, a young international student coming over from Saudi Arabia. He's here for a business degree. He's taking four years to learn so that he can go back and be a successful businessman. But what if your church reached out with hospitality to this man? What if your church reached out with the gospel to this young man and we sent him back with something far more important than a business degree? 
What if we sent him back armed with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and a desire to see his family, his friends, and his people come to know the one true God? What if that's the purpose that we were about? What about all those Kurds in Nashville? What if the churches in that area took seriously the opportunity to get to one of the hardest to reach peoples in the world right there and started planting churches amongst the Kurds so that at some point in time on a Sunday morning in Nashville, you can hear worship to the true and living God in Kurdish. Think of the possibilities that God is making available to the church here in the U.S. right now. And so, just like William Carey tried to answer, if it is our task to make disciples of all nations, and if God is taking some of the least reached peoples of the world and he is putting them in arm's reach of your church, then the question for us is what are we going to do about it? Thank you.